to put it in perspective, right, Georgia, the country, I would say, is half the size of the state in America in, in population and, and in size. Welcome back to How to Lend Money to Strangers, the podcast about lending strategies across the credit lifecycle and around the world. Last week, we were in China, a country with 1 billion people. This week, we're in Georgia, a country of just 4 million people nestled between Eastern Europe and Western Asia. I'm joined by Joffrey Turin. Joffrey started his credit career with a furniture retailer in South Africa before moving through Uganda and Tanzania to Georgia where he is now the director at Credit Insight Analytics. Along the way, Joffrey has developed some impressive experience building models for micro-lenders in emerging markets. If you would like to work with him, you can find more at creditinsight.com. Georgia, it's obviously a country that's not top of people's minds. I know of it, strangely enough, from a wine tasting in Hong Kong when there was a Georgian wine stand. But what is... Georgia like when you are lending? Yeah, so Georgia is a very old country, you know, countries that if you had something in the 18th century, it would be really old. But I mean, here you have buildings that were built in the 5th century. But yeah, maybe just quickly how I got here. So, you know, joined a, a microfinance network of 20 countries and I was the you know, responsible for scoring analytics in Africa. We stayed Uganda and Tanzania and then uh, they got a role as the global lead for credit risk. And that was between the UK and Georgia. And you know, luckily for us, uh, I wanted to, to do Georgia and it kind of worked out, uh, you know, Georgia is just very friendly with visas and work permits uh, and that. So we, we came to Georgia and, you know, I would uh, recommend that to anyone. Put that on your holiday destination. It's, um, it's very affordable, easy to travel and extremely safe as well. But yeah, the 4 million really says a lot. And it's not like the population is growing. Think of DRC, you know, 80 plus million or, you know, Pakistan, 200 plus million population. So Really, people are a lot more excited, obviously, to move into those markets. It's a saturated market. There's 15 commercial banks, two of which uh, control most of the market share. And, uh, you know, there's 30 plus microfinance institutions uh, registered. So if you think about it, 4 million people with 50 credit providers. So it's really tough market. And uh, I think more than 50% of the workforce is related to agricultural uh, industry. So, I mean... They're pretty sophisticated. Uh, I mean, all types of lending. Usually, it's uh, loans for for businesses. Um, uh, there's kind, you know, for cars or home loans or you know, everything's here. Uh, there's one credit bureau, but it's just a tough market. And since it's not growing, it's not as you know, it's kind of just competing for each other's share, really. Yeah, and I would have thought that it would really be quite Russian in influence. But actually, but it actually, when I looked at it, it looks like quite a mix of cultures, but also quite Georgian, I guess, coming from being an old country. Um, so when you look at the brands and the companies operating there, are these regional players or homegrown or is there a mix? It's very much homegrown. Uh, I, I mean, the banks that flourish are usually the, the Georgian ones and they're not in other markets, I would say. Uh, but there are there are companies uh, you know like Finca, ProCredit that are I would say worldwide and also uh, uh, in Georgia. But uh, you know even like like Finca, they've sold uh, you know Finca Georgia. Uh, not that it's not profitable or I mean, it's, it was just you know, it's just difficult to gain market share. Yeah. So I worked in Denmark, which is five and a half million people richer, so more incentive to go. But even in a market like that, if you're there, it was profitable. But the costs of entering meant that it, yeah. it was very difficult. And, you know, fintech, there's always going to be someone who's finding a new way around it. But I think it's not like a, a goods and services or goods where you can just start shipping. You start up financial services, there's new regulations, new new customer expectations. And if you're going to say, well, now I'm going to go to a new country, 4 million people, and I have to pay all that money to, to get there to build trust, um, I can see why it would be tricky. In terms of the risk profile, you know, you're saying it's not growing very fast. Is it, is it kind of a stable market under control risk? Or in terms of environment, you've obviously worked in a, in a few developing markets. And I'll pop back to that point in a, in a minute. But 
what's the risk? Is it a high risk, low risk sort of market? No, I, I think it's pretty low risk. Uh, people and uh, all the companies, I, I think, are very uh, risk averse. That's kind of what I've seen is most of the banks, they follow the same approach. So I, I do think there's opportunity, you know, you know, specifically if you think of COVID, right? COVID would have impacted a lot of institutions. It impacts the credit bureau, right? So there's nothing to do about that, right? So there were instances people couldn't pay. It, it negatively affects your credit bureau. And um, I just see opportunity, for example, speaking to you know, you know our company and just saying, you know, if everyone just goes with the bureau score, that would have been affected, you know. So we, we that idea of finding some of these false bads. But I kind of I kind of got the feeling, right? Um, they're not keen to change the process. So I, I think it's a very everyone follows the same process, uh, which gives some opportunity if you think a bit uh, differently or outside of the box. But uh, it, it's low risk. I mean, um, and and even in COVID, uh, people want to repay. Uh, unemployment is hovers around twenty percent. Uh, inflation's a bit high; it's, it's just above nine percent. But overall, the portfolios—they they look good. You know, low par rates. Um, so I don't think it's a high risk in, in that regard. And Georgia, interesting on the the Russia influence. Uh, they're very friendly with all the neighbors and highly dependent on tourism from Russia and, and neighboring countries. So they they keep a good relationship. So no, I think it's it's low risk. It's just yeah, I think the cost to enter is is very high. Yeah, and, and also the. Just the geography of the of the country. It's um, uh, there's like two main cities. Uh, I would say uh, I guess thirty percent of the population is in Tbilisi, and uh, maybe Batumi the rest. But then the rest of the country it's spread, and uh, we we spent the last week just traveling across the country, and you would see you know it's almost like summer houses or these villages. And in the summer times, people would be there, but there's not much in the in, in the countries. But it's um, it's an amazing experience. Such an old country that. On the one hand, I mean, the city is quite developed, right? Uh, you see, uh, you know, electric cars, the whole place, you know, um, you see so many Teslas and, and all these things. So it's developed in that sense. You you can you pay for your parking on an app. You can order food on app, you know, Airbnb, all those things are here. But if you go to the to the rural part, I mean, it's proper rural. Um, so it's an interesting, interesting dynamic. Uh, so even, even us, we stay a just outside of the, t- also in a village, but it's just outside of the city. And our neighbors have cows, right? And everyone who makes their own wine, and it's like an old style of living. I don't know. I like it. It's it's just a combination of really old history, and uh, I don't know how to explain it. But it's definitely something to to see, and I think it's a interesting place to visit. So just just from my perspective, it's difficult to place. It's something that you know, well, I wasn't used to. And I think it applies a bit to banking as well and the way they do things. It's it's a bit different, right? And you can see working with Georgians that have worked in the UK or Germany, you know, you could see they they have not the traditional approach. And then I think it's nice that there's still in the world these pockets where it is still more unique. You know, thousand year old country is still keeping uh, its own yeah, too. and I mean, if, if you tasted the wine, right? There's two way. There's two ways of making wine. One is, uh, you know, the European way, which is just the the way that everybody knows, and then there's a Georgian way, which is, you know, it takes it takes longer. You know, it takes like nine months and uh, very different wine. So usually that would be our gift traveling. We would take Georgian wine, and yeah, they they have their way of doing it. They do it like that, then it works. You know, and obviously they they love to to say that they are the first country that made wine and always think no that must come from france or somewhere but apparently it's proven yeah i didn't realize that as i said it was we sort of stumbled upon it in a in hong kong of all places one of these kind of world food and wine fairs and there was a tent there of georgian wine um i was there with my friend from moldova and there was some moldovan wine as well so we were just kind of tasting them and they hadn't quite explained that story but yeah i think it's really nice to to hear those stories that don't make the headlines if we go back a step then, and you started your career in South Africa, which is, yeah, we've obviously also got a lot of developing to do, and there's there's big sectors of the market that are left out uh, in many ways. But for all intents and purposes, a pretty developed credit world, at least within the big banks. But from there, you took quite an interesting path, and you, you got into yeah, micro-lending, after university, so my background is actually actual science, and um, I had a friend that worked in in credit, and I just 
uh, I just didn't want to do the insurance, the normal, you know, route. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I joined a furniture retailer in South Africa and they paid my study debt. So I had to work for them for three years. I thought it was a great you know, experience. And, uh, and I ended up working eight, nine years for them. And uh, I learned some very valuable lessons just because they were just an operationally run business, right? So I would come with my statistics and scoring stuff and, and they would just ask practical questions. But how does this work? How does that work? And oftentimes I didn't have the answer, right? I was just like, I mean, this is what it is, um, you know? And, and usually if you speak to, let's say, credit risk directors, you know, people with you know, background, they would kind of, you know, they would just go with it, right? Whatever you say, you know, genie and, you know, and uh, I, I realized just the importance of you have to do sales, right? It's, it's like the, the branches exist to serve the clients and the head office exists to serve the branches. So that mentality helped me extremely a lot. After working for a retail creditor, I worked as a consultant. I was in an unfortunate, fortunate position that, you know, the Scorex guys came to South Africa, started scoring. Uh, and these guys obviously worked with, almost want to say, developed it with, you know, not you know, laptops and all these fancy programs. I mean, a lot of it was done, you know, almost want to say by hand, but uh, really understanding it. And uh, I would say that generation, uh, so that generation then um, taught us how to do it. And then obviously all these uh, you know, software came in, but also having a good understanding of, you know, how it actually works, you know, would you be able to do it uh, by hand? Um, and I think that was also a, a great experience. I worked as a consultant then and, and worked for most of the banks and then, uh, retailers in, in South Africa. And then uh, there was opportunity to do some work for a company in Uganda. Yeah, I was just, we were just married. So me and my wife, we just said, yes, we, we want to go. And um, uh, so I joined Finca Africa and it was an amazing experience. Uh, what I learned there was, you know, joining Finca, um, you know, usually as an analyst, you would come in and just really connect to the data and, you know, do your thing or but uh, joining Think, I realized a lot of these databases and things, they're not in place, right? So now it's, it's more a process of how do we make sure we get data in place to be able to do it? And um, so that's how I joined Finca uh, with six countries in Africa. And it was also an amazing experience. And uh, what I really liked and later, you know, Finca has got 20 countries and just the diversity. So some countries would be NGOs, otherwise other would be a microfinance bank that not allowed to take deposits. Other could take deposits in uh, here in Georgia and Kyrgyzstan. It's commercial banks. So I really like that. It was just a, you know, just extremely you know, different scenarios. Yeah, you, it's under one umbrella, but you are basically a consultant in each country starting afresh. But usually as a consultant, you have the advantage that there's a client who's there to make things happen. You know, try to find, has to find out how the regulations work or how operationally a branch works you can hand that off but because you're inside yeah that's your job as well so you don't just have to teach someone how to build a scorecard or tell somebody fetch me this data and i'll build you a scorecard you've got to know how to build a scorecard and get the data and i guess yeah in each country as you say different not just different countries you've got a whole different organizational structures different banks different rules so yeah i can see why it would be something that would keep you interested for for a while I almost want to say for a lot of companies, the data available is more than the, the skills they have to use it. So we would support the subsidiaries. And you can obviously influence global policy, you know, but these things take long. Uh, but yeah, it is kind of working as a consultant. So it's also going to subsidiaries and, you know, not having the authority to just tell them what to do, but also obviously influence them and, you know, sell the idea. You know, we found some subsidiaries that were comfortable and, you know, you could just get a lot of more, you know, a lot more done there uh, than, than others. But yes, that, that also gave me, uh, uh, you know, a lot of experience as consulting, working with different different organizations. But really also something I learned with that is to understand the data you have and also learning what can be done and, you know, setting realistic ex expectations. So, for example, some projects, it would be, you know, scoring for new clients, but certain data weren't available. And, uh, you know, just knowing what would work and then speaking to the, you know, understanding what's, what the, what's the requirement and then just having confidence and saying it can't be done, right? So if you want to pay these other consultants to do it, by all means do it. But in six months time, you know, when things don't go as expected, you're going to call me again. And, and that happened a couple of times, right? 
it was just gave me confidence to understand basic principles in scoring on credit granting that it's almost like gravity, right? It's just these rules apply. And if you don't have these things in place, it's not going to work. So oftentimes it would be going to a country and say, well, you can't do that now. We need to put these things in place. And that's going to take, let's say, 15 months. But, you know, let's do it. And then, you know, in 15 months, we can we can get going with what you wanted to do now. And oftentimes, you know, it would be, you know, people want a solution now. and But then 18 months later, you know, you think if we just did the, the basics right, we could have been in a position to to do that. So that was an interesting experience. And um, but, uh, I mean, I met remar- remarkable people all over the world. And I mean, it was really amazing experience. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. very broad strokes and and perhaps a bit unfair but if you think about lending in some of these markets it might be easy for somebody in a developed market to think the closest business in in our markets to that would be something like the payday lending you've got payday lenders that are doing small value high risk loans uh, sometimes to populations with limited or, or, or patchy data and i don't want to besmirch the whole industry but often fairly predatory at least their history has been but in fact you take a very different approach even though yes it's small value yes it could be quite high risk yes the data might share some similarities this is very much not payday lending i mean you you talk about prioritizing these loans being beneficial to customers so can you talk a bit about how you think about lending in these markets it might be different to what you would do to a high risk population in a big developed market like the us or even south africa yeah so well you know, working with uh, with companies that, you know, have this mission driven, or oftentimes would say a, a double bottom line, right? Looking at financial inclusion, gender diversity, that puts a different spin on it, uh, you know, and, and oftentimes there are donors and funders that would contribute either technical assistance or funds towards it. So, I mean, that, that's very helpful. Maybe just a quick example, you know, so some type of lending, it's not profitable. Specifically, something that group lending, usually those type of lending, it's not it's not profitable and it's very difficult to manage and to scale. So um, what I like about that is if you can get funding or support with, let's say, a product like that, it's not profitable, but you see it as a, a cost of acquisition, right? Where you join a group, these group needs to meet, you know, weekly or, you know, bi-weekly and it's part of education and they pay off their loan. Uh, but once that's done, you need to migrate them to an individual loan, right? And that that loan would be, you know, profitable for um, for the company. Uh, and I, you know, if you think of responsible lending, it just needs to be a win-win, right? So it, would be, it should be a win for the company first, and then a win for the client. I mean, if the company is not profitable, that's also not responsible, right? To keep deposits, uh, etc. So yeah, the the responsible lending part, you know, I, I thought about that. So it's really not that the scoring or anything would be different, right? It's not that you use different variables or you you exclude other variables, anything like that. When it comes to the scoring, you try and develop the most predictive model to predict risk. And I think uh, when it comes to the responsible lending part, it's really the whole credit underwriting process to have that mindset. So, you know, for example, you develop the scoring to to measure risk, but oftentimes it's, it's different calculations. You determine risk, and then you need to have a separate calculation that looks at affordability, you know, capacity to repay. You know, let's say there is a credit bureau, but, you know, a lot of times, depending on the, the quality of the bureau, there, there's so many unfor- um, informal lending going on that you need to take that into account. So that idea of if you get uh, credit bureau information, that needs to be taken into account, but also living expenses, you know, you could have an average percentage apply to school fees and, and uh, rent and these things aren't on the credit bureau and, and maybe just taking into account informal lending uh, as well, those kind of things. And then there's a third calculation where you calculate the, the loan limit, right? Based on the risk, based on the affordability, you come up with a, what amount can we give this client that he would be able to repay? Because I mean, responsible lending is really just, you need to take all the reasonable steps to ensure you have a pretty good picture of this guy's financial you know, situation. So I would say it's the same, uh, the scoring. I just think a company with that double bottom line, it's easier to keep everyone honest and just say, listen, but we don't just have a goal of making profit. Obviously, it's one of them, but let's let's look at the impact uh, of that. And also thinking of um, not, not just one product, right? So a lot of times if clients have had 
10 of these loans, are they in a better position or not? You know, with, with a company like Finca, you have the luxury to sit and discuss those things. The sort of person that's going to lend in the highest risk market traditionally would be funded by somebody who wants a big return and would have this profit pressure and possibly also just from the ownership team kind of a lot of drive to grow to be the next unicorn, you know, to get the headlines. If you think about a bank and it's really cheap capital, it doesn't necessarily need that same return, but the bank is also probably more conservative and going to stay away from markets. And what you're saying is it's, it's kind of the ownership of these companies, the way they raise funds a bit different. And so that mindset's there. The work you're doing is the same, but that pressure to say we need 50% return on equity every every year, that's gone away. Yeah, but Brendan, maybe, you know, something to, to mention just on developing markets. I think it's, and it, it might be surprising to, you know, you know, you know, some people listening that, uh, you know, might be, you know, the UK or you know, these markets. But uh, something I realized, and it's it's something that's worth noting is usually, I mean, your your show is uh, how to lend to strangers, right? So it's, uh, you know, you wouldn't consider somebody that's existing client or previous client a stranger because you've dealt with them. But that's oftentimes how it works, right? If you're a new client or existing client coming for a loan, you follow the same process. Let's say if there's some scoring, it's the same. It's the same thing, right? So that's something I realized with just all clients that are given loans, any company that's got a core banking system, right? They have to have something just for regulatory purposes and finances. That data is very valuable, right? So that was that was my focus point is if you've got nothing, that's where we start. And it's the type of data required. It's really a monthly snapshot just of the portfolio. And that in any company that is available. Right, it's used by finance, and then if you you can get these summary snapshot of all your clients for the last eighteen months, that is extremely useful. I mean, you've got experience working with bureaus, right? And the bureaus get the same data, but they create different variables, right? And that's usually the differentiating factor between the quality of the bureaus and the same thing there. So if you let's say the last year or year and a half of these files, it is it's extremely predictive, right? So you can see the trends. It's very easy to test it as well. Usually, you know, you just need key variables to work. Balance, the arrears, you know, and usually you would see the the type of products. And that that data can be used to create variables. We call it behavioral scorecards. And it's it's very intuitive. It's easy to test. And uh, it's difficult to test new clients. Where existing client, you can just go with, you know, the, the chief operating officer, go to a branch, have your scoring, talk to the loan officers about the clients. They know them. Right, they you it's surprising how many they have, but they know them by name and test the scoring. So, from my perspective, I can test the stability and the performance of the model, back test it back and forth. But usually, we we test it in the subsidiary in the branches more to convince staff and to convince management. And that's usually the place to start, right? That data, and I, it might seem traditional, but um, oftentimes I, I deal with let's say consultants coming in and. Those basic things, they don't know that. For example, they would try and develop scoring for all clients, new and existing, right? So that's a key to, you know, segment where you would always handle existing clients differently just because you've got m- much more predictive data. It's also useful to educate you know, upwards even, management teams, get them used to scoring so that they also understand the benefits, but also the limitations, right? The limitations of scoring. Once you get that going, got the customer data you can score the entire base end of the month first of the month you can use it for you know retaining the base clients pre-approvals even uh, and while you do that obviously as a developer you would get to know the market the segments the branches then you can start looking at scoring new clients like perfect strangers as you said you've got all this data on existing customers you know how long they're with you you know how they spend when you're with them depending on you might have deposits you might have investments You've got this big pool of customers you've got so much data on. They must like you in some way because they were a customer of yours. Maybe you need to update your brand. The colors might be wrong because they're 20 years old. You can't look at it and just say, okay, here's a scorecard and we fixed your problem. Or we're going to bring in uh, some consultants and build a new scorecard and the problem will be solved. You do need that person to sit in and say, well, this is what a scorecard can do. This is what the data can do and in this bigger context. People wouldn't even think of it as scoring. It's just practically if somebody repays you, you give them another loan. I mean, it's it's almost as simple as that. But it's it's very useful to show a company how many clients you give loans and they settle and they you know they they never come back. 
And a lot of times there's not a focus on that to make sure we retain the, the low risk clients and it's much cheaper than finding a new one. But yeah, so if you can talk a little bit about some of those approaches you've tried and maybe sort of the data you've looked at that did and didn't work uh, in the sort of market, it'd be really interesting. Maybe I'll start with just for, for new clients. So obviously, credit bureau data, if it's predictive, that's that's the best way to go. If you think of lending, right, just break it down to first principles. You have to ask the client some questions or gather data, right? So either you have to get it from the client that tells you, you know, things, which obviously you're going to have to verify some of them, uh, or you can get the data from, you know, external sources like a national ID database or a fraud database or a blacklist database or anything. But if you have nothing like that, then you really just depend on what the clients tell you, or you're going to have to do a, a manual assessment, like a business analysis, which is also costly. But um, I think in some of these markets, you'll always require something like that. If you don't have uh, credit bureau data, you're going to have to do this type of analysis. You know, I, I see in especially microfinance, a big portion of the loans will always have to be reviewed, right? So I think there it's important to have the idea of central underwriting but having an underwriter team and the idea ideal situation would be whatever information they need to make a decision should be in front of them in a digital format and then you can track that how many deals do they see and what's the decision they make and then we can track their performance i mean that's that's key to the to i i think to the process so obviously i people want to automate it what i've seen when people say we use you know cell phone data or social media data to give out loans, you know, I haven't seen that being done for a thousand dollar loan, right? So it's usually, you know, it's usually smaller loan. So if if somebody comes with a success story saying we've given out hundred million dollars of loans, you know, based off of these two thousand variables, it's good to ask some of these questions, right? To understand what's the product, how big are the loans, how does it work, and especially the collections on it, right? So for example, if it is a mobile money and it's based on transactions and you just give everyone a $5 loan. If they repay, you give them $7, 10. And if it is that it's a mobile money operator that let's say it's the main one in the country, right? So there's not five others, then there's some stickiness to it, right? You can't just drop your SIM. And um, if, if they have automatic deductions that as you know, it's your due date, transactions come through the wallet, they subtract it, that product will work doesn't matter what the scoring is, right? If the scoring were good or bad, that product will work. So that's important as well with sometimes with these success stories. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not against uh, alternative data sources. I'm, I'm keen to use, check them all. Um, it, it just, sometimes some of the companies, they get burned by, you know, people promising things, right? Or even if somebody says, you know, uh, we have 2,000 variables and we use this and that, um, you know, it's, it's oftentimes frustrating but also just uh disappointing right when i ask questions okay but you know explain to me because usually scoring models would have eight to 15 variables i mean i can i can i can go with if somebody says it's got 30 variables if they can show me the weightings and correlation and some things but there's no way you're going to develop a model with 200 variables 2000 variables i mean monitoring would be impossible implementation would be impossible so uh, oftentimes when i ask the questions to get more down to it it's it's really not what they, they say it is. But I, I am interested, and, and maybe the other option is if you've got your own app. We're working with a mobile network operator and having our own app where we can see transactions. And I almost want to say applying the same methodology to both, but just the one is clearly successful and the other not. So usually with the, the mobile network operators, they're not always willing to just cancel everything. Right, so usually they work work with banking partners, right? So it's mobile led, but there's a banking partner behind. And usually the relationship's not that if you don't pay your loan, we're going to switch off your, you know, we're not going to cut our own throats. So that makes it difficult. Where what I've seen with with mobile loans that work well is if you if you have something transactional based, and again if you can base the the risk on the transaction, so almost like a salary, right? Think of uh, if if they want your three months bank statement, they want to see your income, right? So similar approach, you can do that. So y you can uh, calculate like the average inflow into a wallet as an income um, and even use that to calculate risk, meaning if it's a stable income, increasing, decreasing. And if you can set it that the uh, deduction is done from the inflow, I mean, that's very low risk. And we've seen that that works very well. 
so that's one way. But obviously, you need the customer to join you to at least transact for three months. So you've got some history. So it's a bit, um, it's not scoring a brand new client, but that's that principle is useful with uh, agent networks based on the transactions. Um, those type of scoring uh, based on transactional, it's it's very predictive and, uh, and usually low risk. Um, so those would be, you know, ones that definitely work. And yeah, then just the, doing the, doing the financial analysis with underwriters, but having the a controlled underwriter, um, almost like a call center, but you have a team, you can educate that team, you can monitor their performance. I think that's the best way to go with bigger loans. It's just a lack of solutions in that technology, right? So I would find fintechs or companies would come in with, with some solution, but it's really just addressing one, one of the capabilities that's required. Let's say, uh, you know, taking it from paper base, you know, like digital applications. But then usually the software is not equipped to, you know, do some basic rules or you can't implement the scoring in there. So oftentimes it's it's not one solution fits all. It's like you need the processes in the in the company, right? Those workflow processes. There's there's always going to be a need for the branch to go and verify something, go and check something, right? But then they need to have the ability to, you know, come back to the branch or have a tablet to say, I verified it. Yes. Uh, and then the process continues. So we know the bureaus, they have decision engines. And, and if you go to the developing markets, they don't even know what it is or why they need it. And, you know, it's got a, a hefty price tag, right? 100,000 plus license a year type of thing. Because the challenge I found was you would go to companies and if you if you look hard enough, you'll find data, right? So you'll find data, especially on existing clients. So you develop uh, a really predictive behavioral model. But how do you implement it, right? That that was my challenge a lot of times. And then you end up, you know, doing an Excel thing, right? Um, so you have a, a Excel with all the customers, their score for the month, their, you know, loan limit, um, pre-approval. But then it's like an Excel thing, you know, and it, it, it's easy to understand that Excel can just be, you know, in a database and you can have systems that reference it. So it doesn't have to be Excels, but just... Uh, to prove that it works, you can just run the score, give an Excel to the head office, give an Excel to each branch, and let's test it. And usually that 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 works, but it's not sustainable, right? You want to have control over over it in a in a better way than Excel. So that's something I'm focusing on a bit uh, in the coming months. Partnered with a with a tech company to see if we can develop some credit decisioning. You know, that's just affordable. That's the one thing. In my first episode, I spoke to Raymond Anderson and. He did a project in Kenya where he said, yeah, they built the scorecard and then the company realized they couldn't implement it. So I'm not sure where, with your experience, but the brief experience I had in Ghana where we worked with this commercial bank that was going, first time they were going to consumer level loans, they had you know, each person in the branch could approve up to a certain amount. If it was above that, it had to go to the branch committee and above that, it had to go to the regional committee and above that to head yeah. office committee. And it was like, if we could just put the rules that you've got now, forget about a scorecard, because that's like a scary word to some people. We're going to put the rules as we're going to write them with you in here. We can look at the paper. You can check you're comfortable. To, like you, you mentioned earlier, like this, we'll give ourselves 18 months. In the future, we'll build a statistical model. But for now, the benefit comes purely from the fact we can see what's happening and you can automatically escalate up. And the same people can do the same job, but it's controlled and we're getting data and sometimes that's going to be a better approach than having a million dollar scoring project that gathers dust that would be a big win but it's not easy to take these branch credit committees right so what i learned there is you have to take them centrally but what you do is you have to take experienced guys in the branches and you know take take them to the head office so at least so branches know, okay, they know these guys. So just instead of having the committee here in the branch, they're having it somewhere else. And, and we have control over that. Um, so that's the first thing. And then just understanding what they are doing, right? So and, and a lot of times it would be going with the attitude of, you know, especially if the company is doing well, you say, you guys know what you're doing, right? So you know, we want to understand what you're doing. And usually it's rules-based. And that's the first thing that you try and do is just track what happens, right? So oftentimes a lot of these companies, they wouldn't be able to produce a report of how many applications they had. It sounds funny, but you would see everything that's dispersed, but you don't always know who came through the door. 
So you don't really know the true accept rate, decline rate. Uh, and even talking about, you know, marketing, you don't have ideas. Now you're trying to link marketing and disbursements. We need to link marketing and applications, et cetera. But what I try to explain sometimes or get this idea, let's, let's, let's let 100% of decisions be made by the underwriters, 100%, or these committees, right? Usually they don't call them underwriters. And then slowly we figure out what they do. And um, then the bottom 5%, you know, based on just rules or scoring, whatever, we just decline those. And we make sure the guys are comfortable. You know, usually they would have declined them as well. And then you start on the top end. Let's prove uh, the, this 5% that just they're the best of the best. And usually, you know, then the underwriters would say, yeah, okay. And, and usually they're 100% aligned. So then you have 10% that's automated, 90% it's still being done. And then you just over time try and, get that gap closer. And when it comes to n- new clients in developing markets, I don't think you can get to, to less than 40%. I think 40% will have to be done by these underwriters. But at least you can have the efficiency gains of the, you know, let's not spend time on the worst ones and the best ones. Because if you just go from the manual approach to automation, that never works. I would also tell people that, the, the reason we can use the behavioral scoring on the existing clients and even give them a, a, another loan without further analysis, it's just the fact that we know the initial analysis was done, right? So I think there's value in doing a proper analysis the first time. And then based on that, you can just continue, you know, maybe check the bureau if you can, or just do the affordability assessments. But yeah, thank you very much. I think we've already run over a bit. So is there anything I've missed? Just something I'm interested in, in you know, obviously you, you see all the blockchain and the crypto stuff, which is sometimes irritating because they just think of, uh, you know, price increasing and, and some crazy people in that uh, field. But something that I do find interesting is uh, some of the projects talk about actually real world problems, right? Uh, creating a digital identity with blockchain. And that's something I can get behind. If that happens, uh, a specific project is uh, Cardano that I follow and you know, if, if that could happen, right, uh, that would be very valuable data, right? Now, I don't know if that's five or 10 years away, but that's something I, I like. And those guys are focusing on Africa. They've got something in Uganda and they talk about, and you know, these markets, they used to mobile wallets. Uh, like in South Africa, nobody understands mobile wallets, right? Uh, the, I mean, it's just, it's more useful than a bank account, right? A, a mobile banking app. Thank you, Joffrey. And thank you for listening. This has been How to Lend Money to Strangers. And we will see you next Thursday. No, oh, cool. Thank you, Brendan, for asking me. I, I enjoyed it. I'm impressed that uh, you had Raymond Anderson. Uh, when I started working, I found his, his first book very, very helpful. And oftentimes, you know, I recommend that book uh, just because it's so thorough.